Waikum salam to both of you. Waalaikum salam, brother. Okay, alhamdulillah, so we can um, start. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyyina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. So alhamdulillah, since there's about, uh, as we know, from next Thursday or Friday, inshallah ta'ala, will be the first day of uh, Ramadan. <coughs> So I thought maybe we can cover we can cover some of the tips, inshallah, like just some ideas uh, and guidelines how you wanna or how you can find success in Ramadan because this type of month or this is the time of the year that a lot of us, Allah knows best, we may never get. Like every single year, we see people who were with us last Ramadan, but by the qadr of Allah. They have passed away and they will not be with us uh, this Ramadan. And of course, in the next six, seven days, any one of us can also pass away. So these are things that a believer has to think about frequently, right? You have to think of death uh, on a frequent basis, not like every single day, every moment of your life, which is also not from the Sunnah, that if somebody is thinking about death, every single moment of his life, he will be very depressed and he's not going to feel like doing anything. So you have to find a balance. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, remember death frequently. He didn't say all the time because that's just not normal. So, but what, what has happened to the people of our generation, we barely uh, think of uh, death and that's why we don't rectify our affairs. And we think that we have unlimited time. And because of that, we don't take advantage of the blessed times, the blessed days, the blessed uh, months that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses us with. Okay, so that should be the first point that you want to keep in the back of your minds that this could be the last Ramadan. Allah knows best. So you want to give this month, your best shot, the best that you've ever done, because there's no guarantee that you will live for another Ramadan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al Quran. This is the month in which the Quran was revealed, and it's a huda lin nas, it's a guidance for mankind. Bayinatim min al huda wal furqan. And it is also a clear proof and criterion between right and wrong. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْ So whoever among you witnesses that month of Ramadan, then he should fast. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coupled this month of Ramadan, gave us this command that whoever witnesses this month, you should be fasting. Because this is the month of the Qur'an. So you have to break up the day and the night. So you have 24 hours. Of course, you're going to need to sleep for some hours. 
this year because of the current circumstances most likely many of us will not go back to work or do our usual activities that we may have been doing in other Ramadans previously. Yeah, the sad part is we may not gather together in the masjid, but at the same time, you're, you don't have work, you don't have school, you're at home. So think of the positives, that this is the month of the Qur'an, and your goal has to be throughout this entire month that at least once you finish the Qur'an, at least once. If you can, inshallah ta'ala, finish more than once, you want to finish five times, ten times, twenty times, if Allah blesses you that you finish fifty times, the more times you finish, the better for you. This is the month of the Qur'an. You don't see a lot of... Wa alaykum as to everybody who's giving the salam. Um, you don't see a lot of intensive classes going on in the month of Ramadan anywhere. Everybody is focused on uh, fasting and their individual uh, uh, obligations to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their individual acts of worship. All throughout the world, this is what you see people doing, the religious people. Of course, those who are not religious, even in the month of Ramadan, uh, they don't really make some change. And we seek Allah's refuge uh, from being like being that heedless about the about the akhirah and the deen. So the Qur'an has to be your primary goal. That in this month, I want to finish the Qur'an at least once. So that's throughout the day, throughout the night that you have, you break up. The wise believer, he divides or she divides his or her time properly. They want to fulfill all the acts of ibadat as much as possible throughout that month. So the Qur'an, finish at least once. If more, if you can do it more, alhamdulillah, the more you do it, the better for you. Then secondly, the second point of, or second idea, is also from the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O you who believe, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ The fasting has been ordained for you or prescribed for you, obligated for you, just like it was obligated for those who came before you. So the act of siyam, this ibadah, this act of worship, don't think that this is just special for the Muslim ummah. Allah makes it very clear. That people before us, people before the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, were also commanded to fast. You look at the Christians, um, because we live in a Christian, predominantly Christian nation, so we should be aware of our surrounding and the people, what the people believe in. Like they have something called Lent, right? They fast for 40 days. And before it starts, it's around February or in February. What do they do? Fat Tuesday and this and that. I mean, I went to school for secular education down south. It is horrible. Horrible what they do in their Mardi Gras, which is right before Lent. Oh, 40 days of fasting is coming up. I can't do this. I can't do that. So a couple of days before or the Tuesday before or the, you know, Ash Wednesday, Fat Tuesday, all these are the things that they have. They go crazy. Literally, they commit zina in the streets. They're dancing naked, uh, drinking, fornicating, because you know they have to start fasting. But what is this Christian perverted fasting concept that they have nowadays? I'm going to fast from fornication for 40 days. Or oh, I'll fast from meat. I'll fast from alcohol. I'll fast from orange juice. I'll fast from this. I'll fast from that. So this is how they have made a mockery of Allah's rules. People forgot. The Jews forgot. The Christians forgot. But it's alhamdulillah still the Muslims, as bad as we are, a lot of us, but alhamdulillah overall, we are still upholding the fasting rituals properly. Right? Though Alhamdulillah. So... Fasting is something that is mandatory upon us, just like it was mandatory for those before us. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ 
And that's the goal. That throughout this month, throughout this month, we have to live in a certain way which will help us attain taqwa. So this fasting has been prescribed for you, just as it was prescribed for those before you. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that perhaps you can attain taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't guarantee that you will because not every individual will be able to attain this goal. Perhaps all of you collectively, individually, can attain taqwa. So the Qur'an, taqwa. These have to be our two primary goals. And of course, Qur'an is part of taqwa. But if you wanted to say, let's say if somebody was really cornering you, what is that one goal of Ramadan? It's not to lose weight. Because subhanAllah, a lot of people, they say, oh, I'm gaining a few extra pounds. Let's see how I can do the fasting, this, that, because... The fact of the matter is, most of the ummah, they cook certain foods for iftar that they do not cook all year round. So Ramadan became a food fest. It's literally a food fest in a lot of homes, in a lot of masajid. Culturally speaking, it's a food fest. People do not understand what the goal of Ramadan is. What a blessed time this is, that this is the absolute best month of the year. This is the month where you earn forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the hadith in Sunan al-Tirmidhi. Once he was getting up to his minbar to deliver the Jum'ah khutbah. Three steps, this is from the sunnah. The minbar has to be three steps. I know maybe you have seen a masajid somewhere. Even Qadr Allah you might see in TV. Even in Mecca and Medina maybe they have higher, higher up whatever it is. We don't look at any place, any country, any city, any masjid, and think that is our religion. Our religion is based on textual evidence. What did Allah say in the Quran? What did the Prophet ﷺ say in the hadith? What did the Sahaba say? This is our deen. Just because someone in some country is doing something doesn't make that the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So we have to be very careful. And a lot of people, they have confusions. Oh, the people who call themselves Salafis or Ahlul Hadith, they are the puppets of Saudi Arabia. No, we're not the puppets of Saudi Arabia. We are the puppets, inshallah ta'ala, puppets of the Qur'an and Hadith. We don't, we don't follow a country blindly. The country is a country, right? So in every single country, you are going to see certain things that contradict the Sunnah. The ulama are continuously teaching, right? Even in masajid in Saudi, you might find gold, writing, decorations all over the masajid. But this contradicts the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Do you think the scholars don't teach this? How else did we learn these? That these are not from the sunnah. But so don't think that Islam is attached to any one country. It's not. Islam is attached to Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the minbar, going back, the minbar from the sunnah is three steps. This is how high the minbar should be. Now the steps, of course, can be measured, spaced out, whatever it is, but the, as long as it's three steps. The Prophet ﷺ, as he took each step, he said, Ameen. The second step, Ameen. The third step, Ameen. Of course, the Sahaba did not hear what he was saying Ameen to. But later on, he explained that Jibreel came to me, alayhi salam, and he made three du'as, to which I said ameen to all three of them. One of those three du'as was, that may Allah destroy the one, or there is no, more, there is no one more unfortunate than the one who sees Ramadan come and go, but he could not earn the forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like this is a complete khasir, a complete loser. He's hopeless, he's doomed. Like the month of Ramadan came, he was alive for those 29, 30 days, yet he could not earn the forgiveness from Allah because Allah is so forgiving and so merciful during this month. This is the month where you rush to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and cry to him and earn forgiveness. But even then someone could not earn the forgiveness by the time Ramadan ended, 
then truly this one is destroyed. He is a loser. Jibreel alayhi salam made the dua that may Allah destroy the one that he found Ramadan, just came and went, was not forgiven. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam said, Ameen. So who are the two individuals who make this dua against all bad Muslims? Jibreel and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. So you have to think about the type of, I mean, the, the best of mankind and the best of the malaika. These two were the ones who made this dua together and said, Ameen. So this is a severe warning to us as believers that you don't want to be from those type of losers that they found Ramadan, but they could not be forgiven by Allah subhanahu or they did not earn Allah's forgiveness. So the Quran, attaining taqwa, or attaining the forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is taqwa? Right, alhamdulillah, our own masjid is named Masjid al-Taqwa. But reality is, all of us, we are failing in taqwa, even though our masjid is even called Masjid al-Taqwa. And this is the reality. E each of us are different. Some people are succeeding some days, failing in other days. Other people are succeeding in those days and failing in some other days. This is the reality of life, right? But use our masjid's name as a motivation, right? I belong to Masjid Taqwa. This is whose member or I come to this masjid, it's, a, it's reminding me of taqwa all the time. This is Ramadan, it's the month of taqwa. I mean, whatever way you can motivate yourself, that's basically what I'm trying to say here. Just think of these, catch these positive points in your life and use them to motivate yourself to perform better in this month, in this coming month. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu and Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, they had a discussion. And no one can define these words better than the Sahaba if it wasn't defined by Rasulullah sallallahu already, right? So they were having a discussion about taqwa. And it was explained from Umar radiallahu anhu that suppose you were walking through a, a, a really a, a garden filled with thorny bushes, right? Imagine you're walking through a garden filled with thorny bushes. How would we walk through that garden? We would really be careful where we are planting our feet. Why? Because we don't want to be pricked by the thorns. So you're very careful as to how you're planting the feet, where you're putting your right foot, where you're putting your left foot, how are you going to get out, where you don't want to get cut or pricked in your arms and other parts of the body either. So you're very careful how you're putting those footsteps. That is the taqwa of Allah. That you're extremely careful. I do not want to violate a single law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want to transgress. I don't want to go past beyond the hudud, the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you are extremely cautious about what is haram and what is halal. The one who can perfect this, that's the one who is a muttaqi. He is from the muttaqun, the one who has attained taqwa. So Ramadan is a training month. It is a training month. And why not? What are we doing from dawn to sunset? From the time Fajr begins until the time of Maghrib. And depending on which time of the year, it can be 7 hours, 8 hours, some people even fast 16, 17, 18, 20 hours even, subhanAllah, in the summer times in far northern European countries or people in Alaska uh, and, and in those northern countries and areas. Some people, subhanAllah, are fasting 20, 21 hours in these long days. We might be fasting, what, 15 hours maybe, 15, 16 hours, 14 hours, something of thereabouts. So more than half of the day, we're going to be in a state of siyam, inshallah ta'ala. So those, more than half of the day, it has to train you. And you have to think about it. We are staying away from water. We're staying away from food. We're staying away from fulfilling our desires with our spouses throughout the day. Water is the basic necessity of life. Absolute basic necessity. Even if someone doesn't have food, as long as he has water, he'll survive. And then, of course, food. 
we abstain from food and drink for more than half of a day. So this should train you. If I can stay away from that which is halal, your spouse is halal for you. Water and food are of course the basic necessities of life without which we will die. So if I can stay away from something that is a basic need, therefore, I should be able to stay away from that which is not a need and is haram. That is taqwa. So la'allakum taqtaqoon, that you use this month, that by the time Ramadan finishes, perhaps you have succeeded in attaining taqwa. You stay away from that which is haram. And you train yourself for the next 11 months until inshallah ta'ala the next Ramadan comes, you are away from the kaba'ir, from the major sins. We're human beings, we're going to fall into minor sins. This is impossible that we will not fall into minor sins. But the kaba'ir, the major sins, zina, alcohol, riba, uh, stealing, cheating, lying, these type of things, destruction, spreading fasad breaking up Muslims' relationships, causing divorces, like these are from the kaba'ir, that you are able to stay away from these major sins, bi'idnillah. So train yourself. Take this month, the 29 or 30 days. That has to be the goal, that you attain the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the hadith collected in Bukhari and others, Narrated by Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu, he said that as-siyamu junnah. This is generally speaking. As-siyamu junnah. Fasting is a shield. This is any type of fasting. You want to fast on Mondays and Thursdays. You want to fast ayyamul bid, the 13th, 14th, 15th, the three white days of the lunar month. You want to fast any day for whatever reason. Any day that you fast, the concept of fasting is a shield. It's a shield for your nafs against the lowly desires that shaitan injects and shaitan lures us with. So it's a shield. And this month you're doing it every single day, continuously for 29 or 30 days. It should truly strengthen your iman. It should suppress your desires, suppress the wants, the, the cravings of your nafs. And you guide your nafs to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and go towards that which is pleasing to Allah and go away from that which is hateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as-siyamu junnah, the fasting is a shield. فَلَا يَرْفُثْ وَلَا يَجْهَلْ So don't go around uh, having the sexual relationship with your spouse. And definitely don't commit zina. If even our spouse is forbidden for us for while we're fasting, then of course zina is even far worse. And wala yajhal, do not go around behaving like a jahil, an ignorant fool. So fasting is not just that you abstain from food and drink for 12 to 14 hours a day, and that's it. Night comes, you eat iftar and you eat food that you don't eat the other 11 months of the year and you call it a night and you've done your job. And then you're already thinking about what type of clothes am I going to buy for Eid? Which is from the sunnah, you buy yourself new clothes for Eid, give your children, there's nothing wrong with it. But we tend to exaggerate. Like the last 10 nights of Ramadan, most people, subhanAllah, a lot of them are busy eat shopping. They're missing the best nights of the year because they are Eid shopping. Why can't you do the Eid shopping in the first couple of days and be done with it? Or the first day, be done with it. Right? You have to utilize your time. Do not follow the footsteps of the losers. That people stay in the malls and markets. And Alhamdulillah, this year, malls and markets are closed. Of course, you still have Amazon and other online shopping. <laughs> we live in the era of the internet. So, but still, it's it's a little bit better, right? Once you go to the aswaq, the souk, the stores, you just lose yourself. You're window shopping so many times. You could be browsing the Amazon through too, that you're looking for stuff that you don't really need and you're wasting hours. But try to keep those satanic tricks away. Fight yourself. 
Don't waste time on, uh, on the internet for useless things. Like subhanAllah, sometimes you find people, they're having social media wars, even in Ramadan, spending hours. You said this, he said this, she said this, this guy did this, that guy did this. This is the way of the losers. Completely stay away from these type of things. Don't waste your life. If you want to go to social media, fine. You want to watch a couple of lectures from this per sheikh or that sheikh. You get some dose of knowledge for the day because even Ramadan, you don't stop seeking knowledge because knowledge is also an act of ibadah. You try to utilize the time, try to do every act of worship that you can. That's what it should be. But don't waste hours and hours browsing the internet, reading nonsense that will not benefit your akhirah or even your dunya. And what do I mean? A lot of our young, it's not just the youth, even uh, elders. Uh, they watch the memes and the vines and all this stuff. Wasting hours. No, it's just a 10 second video. It's so funny. All right, you watch one, then a second, and then a third. And before you know it, you watched 50 videos, 10 seconds each. You didn't waste 10 seconds no more, right? You wasted a, quite a bit of time. So this is how you get tricked by the shaitan. Fight your nafs and stay away from these type of habits this month. So wala yajhal, don't behave foolishly. Don't behave like a jahil and waste your life and waste your time. Wa inim ru'un qatalahu wa shatamahu falyakul inni sa'im marratayn. And if anyone comes to you physic physically wanting to fight you, verbally abusing you, cussing you out, Simply tell that person, Inni sa'im, indeed I'm fasting. And you turn away. The Prophet ﷺ is telling us that things will happen, even in the month of Ramadan. Somebody else will act like a jahil, might physically want to fight you, might cuss you out, verbally abuse you, whatever may be the case. Who knows what's going through that person's mind or what type of heartless person that person is. So you are going to meet other jahil people. So when you meet them, just say, indeed, I'm fasting, and you turn away. Do not waste your day arguing with people. And subhanAllah, one of the things that over the past uh, month we haven't really touched upon, but it is true, sadly, while the people have been locked up during this COVID-19 uh, crisis, a lot of, there has been a lot of increase in domestic abuse. Maybe children who are abused by someone in the family, those children are not safe. For the past one month, they've been locked with their abuser. Maybe a woman is abused by her husband, or a man is abused by his wife, because there are abusive women too. We, I mean, we have to be real here. Whenever we hear the word abuse, ah, oh, another man was abused. No, there are a bunch of abusive women out there. Right? It's not that women are angels and all the men are devils. There's devils in both genders. And there's also very good people among both genders. We have to be just and fair. So whatever it is, these abusive people are stuck in, in, you know, that's it. They're stuck in the house. And there have been cases. I know brothers who deal with these things, law enforcement and things like that. They've even shared that they're, the reports of abuse have gone up during this lockdown because the abuse the, the the abuser hasn't taken a lesson from all of this if he actually opened his eyes and opened his ears and understood the ayat of allah he would stop being abusive or she would stop being abusive but the fact of the matter is those who are deaf dumb and blind they remain deaf dumb and blind so you have to be careful that maybe someone will abuse you verbally, whatever may be the case. You try your best that I'm fasting. I don't want to retaliate. I don't. He, he said something awful to you. Don't say something awful back to that person. Walk away. Preserve your siyam. Preserve your iman. Preserve your Muslim dignity. And just walk away so that you can get the full reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not just the abusive homes. Look at what happens in almost every masjid. Aren't there fights even in Ramadan in masajid? SubhanAllah, I've been to one masjid uh, once. Well, I went there a few times. 
but uh, this was the last time I've been there. So it was a Ramadan program. They invited me. We gave, you know, I was there for the talk. It was a pro. It was me and a couple other brothers were invited. So it was the three of us. So there was like a. It was on a Saturday. So from Dhuhr all the way to Maghrib time, there was a program. Three of us spoke and so on. At iftar time, iftar is being served. Everybody's eating together. From across the table, they started fist fighting. I'm like, what in the world is going on? They're punching each other at iftar time. And guess what the fight was about? You'll never believe it. <laughs> because it was an election was coming up for the masjid presidency and vice presidency right after Eid. So they started fighting already. Who's going to run for the elections? Subhanallah. Filth. Filthy democracy of the kuffar entered our masajid. Like, what is wrong with people that even in the month of Ramadan, while eating iftar, they're going to fight over who's going to be president? Subhanallah. This is the reality of Western Muslims. Alhamdulillah, in Muslim lands, people can't really do this because the governments control stuff. Good or bad, this type of fitna is a way in most Muslim countries. But then these Muslims come to these Western lands. They have no strength. They have no position. And a lot of the immigrants, and again, it's not undermining anybody, but a lot of the people, they came from not so strong backgrounds. That's why they left their country and came here. So then they come here. They see that there's an opportunity for me to somehow get some type of title and recognition. Guess what? I'll beat whoever it is. Whether it's Ramadan or out of Ramadan, I don't care. I just need that title and power. This is a filthy disease that destroys that person, of course, his akhirah, and it destroys a whole community. Because of a handful of people fighting, it's, you will never see a masjid where a hundred people are fighting for the title. Never. Not a single masjid. It's always a handful, just a few people. Most of the ummah doesn't care. Like, yo, man, let me just pray. Let me just learn, right? Those who come to the masjid, that's all they care about. Learning, praying, and leaving. And the ones that don't come, they don't care about Islam at all. So in the midst of all this, a few people might fight. So you have to be careful. If these are the types of backgrounds, uh, historical things that happen, well, stay away. Somebody's abusing you, somebody's cussing you out. You don't want to lose your siyam because of a jahil, because of some other jahil. Right? Don't do this. Be wise. And the Prophet it's the same hadith, he's continuing. That I swear by the one in whose hand is my soul. I swear by the one in whose hand is my soul. The smell, and of course we're not eating, so our breath kind of doesn't smell as nice as, as it should. While you're fasting, you're away from food and drink, your breath changes, this is normal. But the Prophet ﷺ is swearing by Allah that the, bre uh, the breath of the fasting person is more sweet in the sight of Allah than the smell of musk. What a tremendous reward. That every single thing that you're doing while fasting, the reward is multiplied. It is seen in a different way by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is truly a special time. You have to take advantage of this month. Then, the Prophet ﷺ said in another version of this narration, and it's a hadith Qudsi, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, looking at his slaves who are fasting, يَتْرُقُ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ وَشَهْوَتَهُ مِنْ أَجْلِي They have left the drink, uh, the food, and their desires simply for my cause. أَصْيَامُ لِي the fasting is only for me, wa ana ajizi bihi, and I will reward it in return. Wal hasanatu bi ashri amthaliha, and a good deed while fasting, minimum, will be ten folds, because there are other narrations. I'll mention that a little bit uh, in a few minutes. 
in this specific narration that Allah looks at the people that asiyamu li this is a profound statement from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the fasting is for me this is a part of the training let's say when we're praying when we're donating when we are um, i don't know teaching the deen whatever it is that you're doing every act of worship that you do other people are always there to see you and there is the one who is weak no no the concept of riya which is a minor shirk to show off and we have that problem uh, i mean it's it's a widespread disease another one of those diseases that's widespread in the ummah i gave 10000 dollars to the masjid i am the king of the masjid no you're not you're just like everybody else only allah knows who is the king and the queen in jannah but other than that we're all the same we're fighting we're striving to gain taqwa or someone will say you know i did this for the community i do this blabbering away and people see it that thing comes in but the siyam al siyam li as allah says can you show off to people i'm fasting i'm fasting maybe you can say this but what is stopping you when your wife your husband your children no one is there you are by yourself in the room what is stopping you from get, getting a bottle of water and drinking it no one is looking at you there is no riya whatsoever in siyam no one's looking at you but you don't do it because you know that allah can see this is the perfect example of worshiping allah with tawhid that you're free from riya there is no showing off whatsoever who sees whether you have fasted throughout the day every single minute that you stayed away from food and drink and behaving like a jahil staying away from intimacy with your spouse no one is there checking you every single minute of the day except for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so use that this is why Allah is saying that the fasting purely is for me. There is no other intention that can come in between. Because the one who intends to fast for other people, he will pretend not to drink or eat in front of people. But then when he's alone, he will drink and he will have a whole steak. Who knows? That's not fasting. He hasn't fasted. She hasn't fasted. So there is absolutely no chance of riyah while you're fulfilling your siyah. This should train you. You gain taqwa. Do the people who are guilty of riya are they from the muttaqun? No, they're guilty of shirk, shirkul azgar, minor shirk. They're not from the muttaqun. So the fasting is supposed to train you that guard your tongue, guard your heart. Don't show off your Islam. Don't show off that you are praying five times a day, which is the bare minimum you should be doing. Don't show off that you give money to support the masjid, which is again an obligation upon the Muslims to support the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't have a choice. We have to support the house of Allah. We don't have a choice. We have to learn our religion. We have to follow our religion. We have to support the propagation of our religion. These are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated. However, we mess up our deeds by having bad intentions. I want to be seen how much work I'm doing. I want to be seen how much money I'm giving. I want to be seen that people are saying thank you for the rest of their life because I did something. Or I want to be seen, no one but me can do such and such. These are all showing off. All of it is minor shirk. Allah will not accept those type of deeds. So the siyam is supposed to help you, train you understand tawheed why are you staying away from food and drink is it because of your mother if she's yelling at you i'm talking to the teenagers if your parents are yelling at you forced you to fast well guess what when your parents aren't looking you can eat as much as you want you can drink as much as you want but you do this for allah the symbol of tawheed the meaning of la ilaha illallah that i worship that there's no deity worthy of worship except allah alone 
You are a Muslim because of Allah, not because of some other person. You're doing this because of Allah and Allah alone, not because you want to be uh, part of the crew, a member of the crew, the elite class here and an elite class there or the chosen people there, self-proclaimed chosen people there. No, you're doing this only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this has to be understood. And while you're fasting, وَالْحَسَنَةُ بِعَشْرِ أَمْثَالِهَا The deeds, the good deeds are multiplied tenfold. You pray one prayer, Allah will count it as you prayed ten prayers. You fast one day, Allah will count it as you fasted ten days. You fast 29 or 30 days, Allah will count it as 300 days. And then you fast the 6th of Shawwal, 10 days uh, reward again, 6 times 10, 60, 360 days. Didn't the Hadith say, the one who fasts the month of Ramadan, follows it up with the 6 days of Shawwal, it is as if he has fasted the entire year? How did that happen? Because Allah multiplies the reward tenfold. You're fasting, what, 35 days, 34 days, 36 days, but it counts as 360 days. Right? Inshallah ta'ala. So again, take advantage. You donate one dollar to the masjid in the month of Ramadan, it will count as ten, at least, even more. So imagine, the more you give, keep multiplying, ten folds, ten folds, ten folds. So you want to take advantage as much as possible. And of course, again, by the qadr of Allah, this year we may not have that public annual fundraiser that we always have in our masjid. That in Ramadan, during the last 10 days, uh, we have an annual fundraiser. But inshallah ta'ala, the opportunities are there. Even though we're not going to be in a public fundraiser, the 500 people will not see how much you give. The 500 people will not see that you raised your hand for a pledge form. The 500 people will not see that you sent a check to the sheikh who's fundraising. No one will see you. But you can go to the website, donate whatever is easy for you. Allah has seen you. Or, well, there, I mean, Brother Abbad from the management, he actually called me today. They're working on some other forms as well uh, to make it even easier so that you can donate directly to the masjid account from your phones. Uh, all that information, inshallah ta'ala, uh, we will, I'll give it to you once I get it from them. But the point is, that these type of rewards, every single thing, the Prophet Abdullah ibn Abbas said in another hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was of course, he was uh, very generous. This was, he, we know him. But in the month of Ramadan, he was more generous than the wind. Like any penny that he had, give, give away, give away. He didn't want anything to remain in his house. This is the month of charity. So give openly. Right, as much as you can. This is the time. The Prophet ﷺ himself, even though he was a generous human being, most generous than anyone else, but in the month of Ramadan, he would step up his game. So that's what we have to do. In the month of Ramadan, every good thing that you can think of, step up your game. Be the best that you can while fulfilling that uh, good deed. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also in another hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, he said, مَنْ لَمْ يَدَعْ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلَ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ, فليس اللَّهِ فَحَاجَةٌ فِي أَنْ يَدَعَ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ The one who does not give up lying and false actions while fasting in this month, Allah has no need of his thirst and hunger. This is a hadith from Bukhari. So uh, why are you starving yourself? Why are you stay, staying away from drink? Why are you staying away from food? If you cannot stop lying, if you cannot stop doing false actions, things that are shunned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the goal of Ramadan. This is the wisdom behind Ramadan, that you don't just stay away from food and drink and that's it. No, you control, you train your tongue. If you lie about people, train yourself for this month not to lie about people, and inshallah ta'ala, once Ramadan is finished, you will stop lying about people. If you are part of batil, you do false things, things that, and what is batil? We have to clarify because somebody might think, 
I don't like this, so therefore I consider this batil. Batil, something that is false, is according to Allah and His Messenger. Whether we like it or not, if Allah says this is haram, this is something that violates my code, or the Prophet ﷺ says that this is something that violates the morals of a Muslim, this is something that is batil. We're supposed to stay away from it. This is falsehood. Do not bear witness to false statements nor false actions. Stay away from this all. Lying and deceitful actions, which are haram actions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger dislike. You look at in Ramadan, again, the concept of privacy, that you're fasting. It's only Allah that sees the, sees the fasting person. Look what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, that مَنْ سَتَرَ مُسْلِمًا سَتَرَهُ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Whoever um, covers his Muslim brother or her Muslim sister, Allah will cover him on the Day of Judgment. Is there a single human being alive who does not have private sins? Sins that our spouses are unaware of, our children are unaware of, our parents are unaware of, our friends don't know about, but the sins are seen by Allah. So what does this mean? That suppose I'm driving by, right? I drove by and I saw a kid. And this is a real life example that has happened, not just in this city, but happens everywhere, right? Unfortunately. So, and of course, since we live near the ocean, there's a lot of nice alleys. There's a little bay here, a little bay there, and of course there's the beach a few blocks down. I mean, so much nice scenarios to do haram. So some teens are smoking weed, or maybe one of them is smoking weed. There is no one else. This is a private sin. Even though he has done this in the street, but no one has seen him. You are the only one who saw him. What are you supposed to do? Come to Salat al-Fajr, take a microphone. Oh, everyone. The son of Fulan was smoking weed. This is not what you're supposed to do. You don't embarrass a family this way. You don't embarrass your Muslim brother this way. The Prophet ﷺ taught us, Man satara Musliman, whoever covers a Muslim, you are the only one who has seen him commit this sin. Cover his sin. Advise him privately. Don't expose him. Because you also have a lot of private sins. And wallahi, the day of judgment is the time where we need to be covered. So the one who covers a Muslim in this dunya, Allah will cover him on Yawm al Qiyamah. What a beautiful uh, good news. A bushra for the believers. That you, you see your Muslim sister committing a sin. You as a Muslim, don't go blabber this, call all the women of the town up. No, advise her privately. Sister, I saw you do this. This is haram. Fear Allah. Do you need some help? What's going on? You advise the person privately. Cover her sin up. But unfortunately, Muslims don't do this. That this Ramadan, you are privately worshipping Allah. You should learn how to, private, how to cover up the private sins of your brothers and sisters. Build that relationship. This is the opposite. The Prophet wasallam, he told us in the hadith in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, also narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, that all of the ummah, everyone from this ummah will be forgiven. Every single person will be forgiven. Except... For the mujahir. The mujahir. Who is a mujahir? The one who commits a sin at night time. Allah covered him. No one knows. He committed the sin privately. But in the next morning, he goes, Oh, you know what? Last night I was doing this. Last night I was in the clubs partying and shaking it off with this girl. Right? This is what people do. They boast about their sins. So this one is a public sinner. That's what a mujahir is, right? The mujahirun are those who sin shamelessly out in the open.
There's a difference. Public sinners are supposed to be shunned. We don't make friendship with public sinners. We don't act like as if they're the best of the people. Private sinners, we shelter them. Public sinners, we shun them. This is our Sharia. But what do the Muslims do today? A complete buffoon, a crook, a wicked human being, public sinner. They kiss his feet. Oh, sir, brother, oh my God, you're so good. Thank you for this money that you gave to the masjid. They start kissing his feet. The public sinner is raised up and the one who sins privately, he is dug behind, he is exposed and people blackmail the person. Like this is what has happened to Muslims. Suppose somebody's seen somebody's private sin from 10 years ago. Now he's going to hang that around his neck for the rest of his life. Hey man, if you don't keep worshipping me, I'm going to tell the whole community what you did 10 years ago. A'udhu Billah. This is from the worst of human beings who do this with others. You go blackmail people about their sins. Somebody committed a sin 10 years ago. Allah, that's 10 years. There's been plenty of time. How do you know that he didn't repent to Allah and Allah didn't forgive him? But you want to hang that private sin around his neck? That Allah might forgive him. But who are you? But then the public sinner, everybody's hugging and kissing. No, but no, no, you know, he's been here, you know. Uh, this person is a respectable man. We can't really do nothing. Why? You got like, subhanAllah, you have people in Muslim communities. They get arrested for stealing. They get arrested for wife beating. They get arrested for drug dealing. They get arrested for this or that. No, no, no. Let's respect them. Let's respect them. And then a poor brother who may have done a private sin somewhere where only one or two people saw him. He is the black sheep of the whole community. Subhanallah. Like what are what is wrong with the Muslim Ummah? Everything has been flipped upside down. What we're not supposed to do, we do, and what we're supposed to do, we don't do. But Ramadan is the perfect time where you can train yourself to do things the right way and to stay away from that uh, which is wrong. And the Prophet وسلم, and we can end uh, after these couple of points and we'll and, um, um, deal with the questions. That the Prophet Sallallahu since we covered the hadith, that the one who cannot control his tongue, he cannot control his actions while fasting, Allah is not in need of his thirst and hunger. Allah doesn't care. What, are you, what, what is Allah going to do with us remaining thirsty and hungry throughout the day? Nothing. It's not going to benefit Allah. There is no way anyone can benefit Allah. He benefits us. If we worship Him, we are the ones who get rewarded. Whether we don't, we worship him or not. He is Allah. He is Rabbul Alameen. He is subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all glory and praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regardless. But it is for our own good that we submit to him. We uh, turn to him and we utilize these things. Uh, these uh, Take advantage of these times. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in another hadith, he mentioned that there are people that inna min sharrin nas, indeed from, uh, or among the most evil of people, indeed from among the evil people is the one, dhal wajhain, the one who is a possessor of two faces. Among the worst of the people is the one who has two faces. What is two faces? The Prophet ﷺ said, يَأْتِي هَأُولَاءِ بِوَجْهِ وَهَأُولَاءِ بِوَجْهِ he goes to this person with a face. He goes to another person with another face. He goes to a third person with that face. He is a people pleaser. He's with everyone. He's a Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump's with everyone, but actually he's with no one. He's only with himself. That's what the people of multiple faces do. They, they will come to you. Oh my God, he's your best friend. He'll go to your worst enemy and also act like his best friend. So in reality, he's not with anybody. He's not with you, nor is he with your enemy. He's with only himself. He wants to be good with everybody else. So train yourself. And there's a lot of people who are like this. And we have a lot of people. Well, I'm not going to say a lot. We want to be just and fair. There's also some people in our own communities who are like this. And they are the ones who make the bigger problems. If a few people are mistaken, 
they have a dispute with each other, they need some time, whatever it is that they had, misunderstanding, whatever it is that they had in the past. Okay, let them work it out. Three, four people work it out. It's much easier. But then these other little cronies get involved. Goes to this person, brother, you're so nice. Yes, yes, that guy was wrong. He comes to the other guy. Brother, you're so nice. You, Yeah, yeah, he's wrong. What are you doing? You just instigated, instigated both of them to keep on fighting. Right? So this is haram. That this is the possessor of two faces. He goes, he pretends he's with everyone. And the Prophet Sallallahu said in the hadith in, Sahih, uh, in Sunan Abu Dawood, the one who has two faces fit dunya. He has two faces in the dunya. He will have two tongues on Yawm al -Qiyama. This is an indication. Everyone will see you on Yawm al -Qiyama. Then all of your tactics will be exposed. A Muslim is supposed to have one face. A face for Allah. What are you doing while fasting? Whether people can see you or you are completely alone without any human being around you, you are still completing your siyam. One face. So train yourself. Be a one-faced person. The Prophet wasallam isn't there a hadith, numerous a hadith. If he smiled, if he found something funny, he will... He, the Prophet ﷺ, by the way, he didn't laugh like we do. Like, ah, ha, ha, ha. We're like that, right? But the Prophet ﷺ never laughed. He smiled to the point that his molar teeth would be seen. So that was a sign like this is truly funny to him or he was really pleased. So this, he would give big smiles, basically. So if he found something nice, funny, pleasing, he, it would show on his face. If he was depressed, he was sad by something, it would show on his face. People will see tears coming out of his eyes. If anything angered him, people would see the redness of his face. He was a man who never hid his emotions. Right? Wasn't there an incident when somebody had done uh, something wrong? Umar radiallahu anhu and the others, they were waiting. They thought, and the Prophet Islam after said, why weren't you doing anything? Or so we were waiting for you to like give a wink or some type of indication so then we know that this guy has to be punished. And the Prophet ﷺ said, this is not from us. We don't do this. We're not going to wink or make some symbols and signs. Hey, now, whatever it is that we want, it will show on our face. If we're angry, if we're sad, if we're happy, we have one face. That's the sign of a Muslim. Look at the Sahaba. Somebody would come to Abdullah ibn Umar. I love you for the sake of Allah. And he would return, and I hate you for the sake of Allah. That was how the Sahaba were. And I was like, what? What do you mean you hate me for the sake of Allah? You're praying wrong. You did this wrong. You committed this haram. You're doing this thing wrong. You're defying the sunnah in this way. They were upfront, blunt with each other. That's the way of Islam. But when we see upfront blunt people, someone will say, ah, that guy, he doesn't know how to talk. He has no filter. Are you going to say that to Umar radiallahu anhu? Hey man, you don't have a filter in your mouth. Why are you always calling out what's wrong and what's right? Would anyone dare to say that to Umar if he was alive? But this was the way of the companions. This was the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you don't like something, you say it. Right? But you cannot be a people pleaser. You go everywhere, you're with everybody. Why? Why don't you try this hard to be with Allah? Why don't you try this hard to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Why don't you learn the sunnah? Plant your feet firmly on the sunnah. Do your level best to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Day before last night, we said the dua of Asiya. Right? She, what did she, just as a reminder, if anybody had missed it, the dua that Asiya made, as Allah mentioned in the Quran, that Rabbi ibni li indaka baytan fil jannah. Allah built her house for me. Make me near to you. She chose Allah as her neighbor first. Then she asked for the house. So we are supposed to follow the footsteps of these righteous believers of the past. That be pleasing to Allah. That's who you should strive hard to please. Not this person or that person. And if 
someone truly strives hard to please Allah, Allah will take care of his public affairs. Fix your private life with Allah, Allah will fix your public life with people. Leave it to Allah. But people don't understand this. They get involved, they make more trouble, they make more fasad, and they violate the guidelines of Allah and His Messenger So as you can see, brothers and sisters, to fully take advantage of the month of Ramadan, you have to control your tongue. You have to control your limbs. You have to control your heart. You have to control your mind. Everything has to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you can perhaps attain taqwa. So with this, inshallah, let's um, entertain uh, the questions. I see there were quite a few of them. All right, so let's try to go in order. So the brother said, is there a difference between, is asking, is there between ishraq and duha prayer? Salat al-ishraq or duha is the exact same prayer. It's not two different prayers, so there is no difference. Or will the, with the coronavirus problems around, is it feasible to still do Jumu'ah? Have any fatwa, official fatwa been given in this matter? Oh, okay. So, uh, of course, this is, I, I know Ramadan's coming up. Maybe people are more concerned about Jumu'ah even more that they don't want to miss uh, Jumu'ah uh, during the month of Ramadan. But it is what it is. We did not choose to be in this type of situation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <laughs> that's my son wanting to come in. <laughs> he, wa he waited, uh, let's see, 45 minutes. <laughs> that was his patience. But anyways, inshallah. <coughs> so, I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put us in this situation. He's testing us through this. He's testing our iman. He's testing our practice. He's testing our uh, wisdom. Just our sanity as, a, as, a, as human beings. If there is the white outspread of the contagious disease, of course we take our precautions from a shari standpoint. That's one. Secondly, we're also bound by the laws of this country. Like for example, us living in the state of New Jersey. I can't speak for states like Montana and North Dakota and South Dakota, but we are living in New Jersey. And we are the ones who are suffering the second most in the whole country. New York, of course, is, a, is in a horrible situation. But the state of New Jersey is the second worst in terms of patients as well as deaths. So our situation really, we can't break the state law. So the governor still has the law in place. More than 10 people cannot congregate. So we're going to make shari trouble. And then we're also going to make legal trouble. We're going to be violating the laws of Allah as well as the laws of this man-made system. We don't want to do that. Muslims don't want to look like criminals. We shouldn't be doing that. So we have stuff to uphold. We are, we are bound by these type of laws. If the governor relaxes, and Allah knows best, we don't know what's going to happen. Once the state relaxes, then of course we go based on what they relax. Maybe next month they might say, no more than 50 can congregate. All right? So... I, <laughs> Let's be realistic again. You know your community, right? I, I used to come as a visitor for over a decade, but I'm living here for two and a half years. You guys have been here for 20, 30 years. Don't you know yourselves? Would I be, a, let me, forget the management. I'll stand at the door. I'll count 50 people and then close the door. The 51st person cannot come back, come, come inside. Will you listen if we do this in the masjid? <laughs> you won't, right? But let's suppose if that is the law, okay, we'll try to, we'll try to accommodate. As long as first, first come, first serve, 50 people can pay attention and not make fitna and start fighting, then it is what it is. So we are bound by these state laws. We cannot open it up for Taraweeh. We cannot open it up for Juma or anything like that. We have some limitations. It's by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We did not choose this. We have been forced as a test from Allah to be in this situation. How we pass this test is important. 
That's what matters to us. Allah is testing us. Will I remain patient, follow the laws of Allah, and then the laws of the state? Or am I going to just become a hooligan, rebel against everybody, and make more trouble? Secondly, I actually heard today, and I heard two weeks back from another brother, that one of the masajid here is holding a Juma secretly or something. I don't know what they're doing. And some people are going there. I would highly advise, do not do this. Do not break the laws of the Sharia and do not break the laws of the state. More important than this, do not break the laws of your Aqidah. Right? And the masjid that's doing this is the same masjid where they'll have dancing dhikrs. Right? They don't hide their Sufism da'wah. They don't hide it. It's on their website. It's on their Facebook. It's, on, it's in their lectures. They promote Sufism. This is the group that they belong to. So if you are somebody who has a little bit love for the Sunnah, if you truly understand the Sunnah, why would you leave a place where you're hearing Tawheed, a place where you're hearing the Sunnah, why would you leave that and go to a place where people are doing Allah, 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 who, 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 who? What is this? That's where you want to go? What have you truly tasted about Tawheed? And that's not an exaggeration, by the way. They actually do that. They have weekly dhikr circles. They sit in a circle and they chant and they do this. So everything that you can think of of Sufism, they do it. Right? They're, they have classes where they speak ill of the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They promote a wrong understanding of Tawheed al asma wa sifat which is Tawheed of Allah. So these are things that you have to be careful of. You can't be today I'm with Ahlu Sunnah, tomorrow I'm with a Sufi, day after tomorrow I'm with a Shia, after that I'll be with a Christian, and then on Saturday I'll be with the Jews. That means you're a man without a religion. Choose something. You have to stick to one side. If you're with Islam, then be with Islam properly. If you're with Ahlu Sunnah, then be with Ahlu Sunnah properly. You can't I mean, the, the deen of Islam is not a mixed fruit basket where I'm going to put a pineapple, a little bit of pieces of apple, and then the oranges and some grapes and some cherries and some strawberries. It, it's not a fruit basket. We are bound by the Sharia of Allah. Our religion is based on the Quran and the authentic Sunnah, the interpretations of the companions. So you should safeguard your Aqidah too. Even, this is even more important than any state law. That don't go somewhere that you listen to something and then you become shaky and then you forget Tawheed. This is not what you should do. Do not put yourself in a fitna situation where maybe you are not that well versed yet and then you hear something wrong and then you get completely confused about what's right, what's wrong and then you think everything is fine. Right? Save yourself from confusion. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, let's see. Alright, so a brother is asking, can we do a tafsir series of the Qur'an? Uh, this, I'll, I'll actually mention, I already had this plan, but before we end tonight, I have a question for everybody, and then we'll go about. So let me answer that later. Uh, <clears throat> is sharing a meme to just make someone laugh or smile haram? It depends on the content of uh, the meme. <laughs> like, I've seen one meme. <laughs> the, the meme said, Arab men are abusive. So there's a picture of a Bedouin and underneath it says, did someone say Abu Yusuf? <laughs> as funny as that sounds, but it's also depicting all Arab men in a very bad way. Not all Muslim Arab men are abusive, right? If you want to talk that way, what about American men? There's men who kill their wives. There's men who kill their girlfriends every single day in America. There are men being arrested who kill their wife, who kill their girlfriends, who kill their own children. So how about we make a meme, American men are abusive. No one's going to laugh at that. So as a Muslim, you should be, uh, you know, you should worry. You should, you should feel some type of honor that, you know, a Muslim or a Muslim in general is being depicted this way, or like 
uh, how they teach you. Like, uh, if if they see, I mean, I saw this growing up here. I mean, this is the reality of America. What even if people don't like saying this, but this is the reality. If they see an African American driving a nice BMW or Mercedes, most likely he'll get stopped. That's like, yo, man, where'd you get this money? What's wrong with you? A brother can't do legal business. A brother can't get educated and be a doctor, lawyer, or something and afford the bends in a nice way, right? Or you see how white cops are always, uh, not all white cops, but some of them, there's a lot of prejudice against African Americans, a blanket general statement. So, but people then say it's a joke, right? This is not a joke. We should not be laughing at these type of memes or jokes, which races are involved, right? We stay away from that. But if it's something innocent, something within the premises of Islam that's something nice and funny, you share a joke with one another, this is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, the Sahaba used to do that with themselves. So you stay within the realm of Islam, and inshallah ta'ala, you smile like the Prophet wasallam said in the hadith in Sahih Muslim. Smiling at your brother is a sadaqah. A Muslim woman smiling at her sister is a sadaqah. Just giving a smile. Right, you're giving a salam, you smile, the person smiles back, your brother smiles back, says, Wa alaikum salam, this is a sadaqah on your parts. So use that in a proper way. Uh, how did the Prophet Dawood alayhi salam and fast every other day? Also fast like the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salam only Mondays and Thursdays. I'm thinking of fasting every Saturday, Monday and Thursdays. Is it okay? Um... <clears throat> If I do that, I get to fast like both of them. Um, actually, if you do that, you will not be fasting like both of them. The Prophet ﷺ made it very clear. Do not fast on Saturday by itself. If you need to, chew the bark of a tree, but break your siyam. Unless it's in Ramadan, right? So if you are fasting a Saturday by itself, this is uh, not something that you're supposed to do. If need be, you chew the bark of a tree, but you break your siyam. Don't fast Saturday by itself. Same thing with Friday. It's a day of Eid. You don't fast Friday by itself. Now, if somebody is joining all of them together, uh, or someone is fasting every other day, that's another hadith, it's his habit. He fasts one day, he breaks the next day. He fasts one day, he breaks the next day. Of course, he will end up fasting every other day. Right, he will, it will fall on these days too. That's a different hadith. The Prophet ﷺ made an ex exemption for that. But someone all of out of the blue, he doesn't have the habit of fasting every other day. Very few people do that. All of a sudden, he wants to fast a Saturday. No, you don't fast Saturday by your by itself or Friday by itself. This is uh, from clear a hadith. But Mondays and Thursdays, this is fine. That's from the Sunnah as well. And the Dawood, the fasting of Dawood, the Prophet ﷺ said that the best siyam was the siyam of Dawood. He used to fast one day, break the next day. Fast one day, break the next day. If somebody is able to do that, fine, that's not an issue. But this is not something that you uh, like really have to kill yourself over that I can't do this. Not everybody is capable of doing it. All right, so Taraweeh prayer, can we pray how it's going to work in Ramadan? Can we pray Taraweeh in Jama'at at home? As, as we said repeatedly, and inshallah ta'ala, it, 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 it seems like there's two questions that do not leave me in this community. <laughs> one is the meat question, and then the other one is the Taraweeh and Tahajjud question. So, all right, the meat question I'll understand, because let's say there's valid differences, but... The Taraweeh Tahajjud, right? It is the same prayer, the exact same thing that the Prophet ﷺ used to pray all throughout the year. And this is the hadith collected in Sahih al-Bukhari. Our mother Aisha was asked, radiallahu anha, how was the night prayer of Rasulullah ﷺ? She said, he used to pray four raka'at, taweel, it was, they, were, they were long. Don't ask me how beautiful and how lengthy I can. Words cannot describe the beauty and the perfection and the length of those four rakat. So don't even bother asking about it. Then he prayed another four. Again, don't ask me about the beauty, the length, the, uh, the description. Is, words cannot describe the perfection of those prayers. Then he would pray three, making it ihda asha, 11. 
11 raka'at fi Ramadan, in Ramadan, or outside of Ramadan, ghayri Ramadan. Didn't matter. It did not matter if it's the month of Ramadan or it's some one of the other 11 months of the year. It is the exact same prayer prayed all throughout the year. We call it tahajjud, we call it salatul layl, the night prayer. We call it qiyamul layl, standing at night. We call it salatul witr, the odd prayer. And in Ramadan, we call it salatul tarawih, the prayer in which you take rest. So five names for the exact same prayer. You can pray by yourself or you can pray in a jama'ah. No problem. Th this year, the masjid, by the qadr of Allah, will be closed. Can you pray the qi uh, qiyamul layl in your house as a jama'ah? Of course. You want to pray by yourself? You can do that. You want to pray as a jama'ah, as a family? You can do that. Just like any other tahajjud night. So understand that it is the exact same prayer with five different names. Is hunting or fishing allowed during Ramadan? Yes, of course. Otherwise, how will you eat food? Right? How are you going to make delicious iftar if you don't slaughter a chicken or hunt a deer, uh, slaughter a cow or uh, go fishing? What are you going to eat for iftar and dinner? So that's all fine. <clears throat> I heard from my mom's nephew that there was a Sahabi he had a flying horse, and he came to Atlantic City Shores. <laughs> he has a lot of ilm with him, with a flying horse, and the guy was a Sahabi. He touched the Atlantic City Shores. Uh, it, it seems like your mom's nephew knows something that no alim in the world has ever known before. So this is, this is bogus. There is no truth to it whatsoever. Uh, these sound like just some village folk tales, right? Uh, a lot of times people... Uh, no joke. No joke. I heard in a khutbah once. In a khutbah. The uh, cucumber, right? Uh, or uh, he, I think he probably got... It wasn't cucumber because somebody could get mixed up with the pumpkin and that the gourd family. I think he probably misunderstood uh, the hadith. It was some other vegetable, I can't think of it. But anyways, that vegetable is not even found in Arabia. It's found in that specific culture where, where I heard the khutbah from, in that country. I'm not going to mention which country. So it's only found there, literally. That vegetable is not found anywhere else. So the khatib is saying this vegetable, this was from the sunnah. And he also said it's in Sahih al-Bukhari. And I'm like looking around. None of these people are going to go and open Sahih al-Bukhari and look for that hadith and come back tomorrow and say, hey man, where'd you get this from? So a lot of times people tend to exaggerate. Maybe they're doing something to get some followers or to make people believe that they're doing something right. They might say something like this. Uh, you know, so maybe, I don't know, he came to Atlantic City. Uh, he really liked it. He wanted to encourage the other relatives to come to Atlantic City and heard some story. Who knows? You know, Allah knows best, but this is completely false. <clears throat> for the people living near the poles of the earth, where there is sunlight for 23 hours, 50 minutes, or sunlight for just 10 minutes, what times should they follow for fasting? Uh, this question was presented to uh, the ulama. For example, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah, Let's suppose where, like in parts of Alaska, six months of the year, it's like even at midnight, it's 12.30, 1 a.m. The south sun is like out and about. And then again, six months, it's nighttime. In, in the noon, it's still dark, completely dark. So those countries where Muslims living in those type of places where they don't have a usual uh, day and night, the ulama, they said that they should follow the nearest country which has some type of uh, normalcy to it. And then they follow that schedule of their fasting. So let's say somebody in Sweden might be fasting for 20 hours. There is still a distinction between day and night, even though the night is just four hours. 
But then you have some places where maybe it's just one hour or half an hour or something like this. This is unusual. So they have to follow the nearest country with some type of daylight, nighttime, some type of distinction, and they follow that schedule bi idnillah. So our U brother Yusuf is asking, what is Ramadan actually about? So it's about being good, listening to Allah, obeying Allah properly, which is taqwa. And of course, kids like yourself, inshallah, and all the other kids, uh, train yourself to be more obedient to your parents as well in this month. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that you have to guard your tongue from being like a jahil. You should guard yourself from behaving like a jahil. Right? So you don't want to disobey your parents in the good things that they say. Uh, you want to help them out. Your mom's going to be fasting. Uh, your father's going to be fasting. You're also fasting, inshallah ta'ala, probably, even if not all, because, uh, yeah, you, yeah, you, I got confused with Adam first. But yeah, Yusuf, you haven't reached puberty yet, so it's not like you have to fast every single day, but inshallah ta'ala, uh, you should practice uh, at least fast a few days just to try it out, get yourself in the training mode, and inshallah, so when you attain puberty, then you are ready to fast all the days and you don't feel too lazy to do them. So help your family out. These are good deeds. Uh, you're, you're doing this for the sake of Allah, helping your mother out. She's already fasting, then she has to make iftar and dinner for all the people in the house. Or your father's doing something, he's fasting, he's cleaning, doing something in the garage or something, you want to go help out. All of this, inshallah ta'ala, you'll earn reward uh, as, as a young child. You're trying to do these things for your parents for the sake of Allah. And you're training yourself in every aspect of your life. Right, so this is inshallah ta'ala. If you can do this properly, it'll be a great Ramadan for you uh, at this age, right? So inshallah, just keep this as the goal. Um, can we pray salah sitting in the car when we are outside? So, as we as I said, uh, if it's a fard salah, you cannot uh, pray sitting down unless there is something physically wrong with you, right? Uh, uh, something is physically wrong with you. If it's a nafal salah, you want to sit while riding as a passenger, of course, not as, uh, you know, you park your car, then you sit praying, no problem. Or you're a passenger in the car, somebody else is driving and you're sitting as a passenger, you can still pray your nafal salah because the Prophet ﷺ prayed nafal salah while riding his camel. He didn't make the camel stop. But if it's a fard salah, you pull your car over to a safe place then you get down from your car and you pray, standing, bowing down and everything. All right, Brother Fahim, good to see you here. Hopefully all of your kids, everybody is uh, fine. And that goes for everybody, of course. Um, uh, it's, it's difficult on me to call all the hundreds, nearly thousand people. But I've been trying, at least I, I break my time up. A few days here, I call a few people, text a few people. So inshallah, hopefully everybody is uh, doing good and staying safe and healthy. Uh, during the reciting of the Qur'an, what's the Islamic rules while sitting or laying down or reciting on device or uh, the original Mus'haf, meaning the book? You can pr recite Qur'an laying down, no problem. You can recite Qur'an sitting down, you can recite the Qur'an on your phone, um, right? You can hold the Mus'haf, sit and recite. All of that is fine, uh, inshallah ta'ala. But like you'll see something, what would be wrong would be like, let's say when you're reciting Quran, I know a lot of people culturally speaking, uh, they do this. They like they might be rocking back and forth as they're reciting Quran. This is not from our religion. That you should stop, inshallah ta'ala, and uh, try to break out of that habit. It is very, very similar to how the Jews, they rock back and forth and they pray. So this is part of their prayer. This is the movement that they make. So we are clearly distinguished between the Yahud or the Nasara or any other kuffar when it comes to our ibadat. So don't rock back and forth while you're memorizing Quran or reciting Quran. But you want to lay down, uh, sit down, whatever it is, phone, mushaf, all that is fine, inshallah ta'ala. <clears throat> 
On the, ju on the day of judgment, are we all going to be questioned in public, front of every single creature that ever existed? Yes, everything is out in the omen, open. Allah even said in the Quran, يَوْمَ تُبْلَى إِسْرَائِرْ uh, تُبْلَى إِسْرَائِرْ That this is the day uh, when all secrets will be exposed. And the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, that the people will be resurrected, naked, barefooted, and uncircumcised. This is how they'll be re resurrected. Just like how we were born, we come into this world naked, barefooted, uncircumcised. This is how we come out of our mother's womb. This is how we'll be resurrected out of our graves on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. SubhanAllah, now look at this. And this is for especially for the sisters. When the Prophet ﷺ said this, our mother Aisha, she said, right, it clicked. Everybody's going to be naked. Won't the men look at the women and the women see the aura of the men and everybody's going to see the aura? This is a woman of modesty. This is the believing woman. That even though the Prophet ﷺ is telling this, she cares about morals. She cares about modesty. That is the sign of Islam for men and women, right? They have morals and they have modesty. They have, they feel shame. So the Prophet ﷺ then replied to her that that day everyone will be busy. No one is going to have the chance even be thinking, let me look at the guy next to me. Because everyone, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy on all of us, but everyone will be super, super stressed out, worried about what is going to happen to themselves. They won't have the time to be looking around and, oh, that guy's uh, walking around uh, naked and this and that. No one's going to think this way. But however, every single person will be resurrected, naked, uh, barefooted, and uncircumcised. Can we say, Ya Rasulullah? The word Ya yeah in Arabic, this is used to call on somebody, all right? Like, let's say, I might tell my kids, Ya binti, Ya waladi, oh my daughter, oh my son, come here. They're, they're there, they're living, they're right in front of me. You might call out your friend, Ya fulan, you see him, he's across the street, Ya fulan, right? And then he turns. Somebody is living, and you're calling him with this word of Ya, yeah, this is fine because you're trying to get this person's attention. But the dead, the one who is who has passed away, now you don't call him. How is he going to hear you? How will he respond to you? That ya yeah, is only for Allah. You say, Ya Rabbi, Ya Allah. This is only reserved for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? If you're using Ya Rasulullah or the Shia do, Ya Ali, Ya Hussein, Ya Hassan. Ya Fatima, it is the exact same thing as Christians do. Oh, Jesus, oh, Mother Mary, Mother of God. This is what they're saying, right? We translate even Ya yeah as Oh. They're calling upon these prophets. They're calling upon these Sahaba. They have died. They cannot offer you any supernatural help. They cannot respond to you. Nothing of that sort. So you use this word for the living to get their uh, attention. Or you might say, Ya Ummi, uh, give me some more food. Oh my mom, give me some more food, right? She's there. She is able to respond to you. But after your mother passes away, may Allah grant her mercy and Jannah, are you going to still say, Ya Ummi, give me food? She has passed away, right? So you don't use this word for people who have passed away. And so calling out, Ya Rasulullah, this is a type of shirk. So we don't do this with anyone who has passed away. Anyone. Can we pray in our seat in the airplane? It's the same ruling as the car. I know maybe you might do this out of shyness or fear. Especially after September 11th, a lot of people might be praying while sitting in the planes out of fear. <clears throat> Unless you're flying Saudi Airlines, which has a musalla in the plane, Allahumma barik. Uh, you're going to have to ask the steward or stewardess. And they'll permit you. Don't worry about it, right? I flew United Airlines before. I asked for permission. They let me pray. So 
they don't let you, I think it was United when they had an issue with some sister trying to ask for an unopened can of Coke. So I, I don't know. <laughs> it was either United or American Airlines a year ago or a couple of years ago. But the thing is, um, if you ask them, just break your shyness that you know, I got to pray. They'll let you pray in that small area where they are there. They keep their food and stuff <clears throat> in the back. So this is not an issue. So again, Fard Salah, you cannot pray sitting unless there is something physically wrong with you that prevents you from standing. Okay, let's look at some other, couple of other questions. Um, okay, so it's kind of similar. In these days, if I can find a masjid that holds Jama'ah and Jum'ah, will I get extra reward to try and join them? Again, because we're bound by the state laws, you're not going to get any extra reward for violating laws uh, of this nature, right? As Muslims, we're supposed to respect the laws of the land uh, that are within the folds of Islam. Uh, and of course, the, the laws that are not within the folds of Islam, we don't go around publicly rebelling and making nonsense trouble. It is what it is. Like, what do I mean? Because this is uh, has to be clarified. The law in America is... <clears throat> If you're over 21, you can drink alcohol. Go drink as much as you want. It's the American law. As a Muslim, that I, don't, I could care less about this law. It doesn't matter if I'm below 21 or over 21. Alcohol is haram for me. I have to fulfill the laws of Allah. Just because I'm over 21 doesn't mean I'm going to start going and drinking alcohol because this is the law of the land. You're allowed to drink. No one is forcing you. There's nothing wrong with it. If you don't, Drink alcohol, no one's going to put you in prison, no one's going to gun you down, no one's going to do any. It's not a matter of life and death, right? So those type of laws, we care about Islam. This is not actually going to break peace of anybody. It's not terrorizing anybody or nothing like that. So you have to learn which laws we respect. Like these type of state laws, this is considering it illegal. If you break this law, this is illegal. They're fining people. Uh, cops are stopping them, arresting them. So many things are happening in different areas. So this is clearly uh, breaking the law and we should not be uh, doing that. You're, you're not going to get an extra reward for this. And Allah forbid, if you end up spreading the virus, you'll actually earn sin. Right? You'll earn sin. Why are you going around behaving foolishly and, and being an agent of spreading the disease? So you have to Safeguard yourself and safeguard other people. If I wake up a little late for Fajr, is it okay to quickly eat a little bit before starting the fast? Uh, no, this is obviously your fasting will not be valid. <clears throat> the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, make or eat the sahur. Why? Because in the sahur is a barakah. There is blessing. So I know it's hard, it's difficult, nobody usually eats uh, around 3 a.m., 4 a.m., but you're going to have to do this. So you wake up and eat the sahur. There's a special barakah in the sahur. But if you woke up after fajr, the time to eat is gone. Because the moment fajr starts, you have to stop eating and drinking. This will not count as fasting if you ate after uh, fajr. Uh, what's the question? Yeah, so again, let's say, good point. The brother said, let, let's say the dua that when we're giving, Ya Ahl al Qubur. Uh, now, you have to again uh, understand here. Are you asking anything? In that dua to Ahl al uh, uh, the, peop uh, the people in the grave, Ahl al Qubur, that you're saying, Ya Ahl al Qubur, you're giving them salam. You are literally not asking anything from them. Usually, uh, I should have explained further, usually when people bring about the Ya, yeah, it tends to go back and they're, they're asking something. Usually when people are saying, Ya Rasulullah, those who do it, they end up asking him for something. That is what is the shirk. 
So it, when we go to the graveyard, we are calling out to them. We're not asking them for anything. We're just giving the salam. We're telling them we're going to join you, inshallah. We're hoping that Allah is putting peace upon them. We're actually making dua for them. We're not asking anything from them. So that is the key point, that you can ask the living to do something because they are living, they have the ability to respond to you, whatever it is, simple thing. But once someone dies, you do not ask them for something for you. So let me be a specific for that. So it's good the brother asked that follow-up question. So that is clarified. Uh, now in the, in the tashahud, that O Prophet, right? Again, are we asking the Prophet for anything? We are sending the Salat upon the Prophet ﷺ. We're making dua for his whole family. We're making dua for him. We are sending the salutations of Allah upon him. So we're not asking anything of him, right? So if you can fulfill that, right, that's, that's fine when you're using that. What becomes the statement of shirk is when you're using the word ya yeah for the deceased and you are asking something from them. That is what is the shirk. Um, I see this statement from Brother Khairul, but what's the question? I know I want... Oh, the question... Oh, I'm sorry, I misread it. I want to know about you because we are proud of... Please let us know if you don't mind. Uh, what is it that you would like to know, inshallah? That would be more specific. I mean, if you want to know about me, I was like, uh, yes, I like steaks. I, I, I like riding bikes and cars. <laughs> so you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be specific, inshallah. Um, if someone walks in front of me while I'm praying salah, do I have to do the whole salah again? Crossing in front of someone who prays. Well, let's backtrack. First of all, hopefully everybody knows. When you pray, the Prophet wasallam said in the hadith narrated by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu anhu in Abu Dawood, that إِذَا صَلَّى أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيُصَلِّي إِلَى sutra. Whenever any one of you stand for the salah, you're about to pray, then pray towards a sutra. Sutra is a covering. Pray something, even this water bottle, it's tall enough, something like this is a valid sutra inshallah you put this in front of you and then you pray so that no one will cross in front of your salah if there is a wall you and and the hadith continues and you're supposed to get close to it if there is a wall you move up get close to the wall that wall will be your sutra but you, the glasses i can't take my glasses off put it on the floor and think that this is a sutra this is not a valid sutra it has to be something erect, something raised up, like about three inches or so, right? Uh, so uh, glasses don't fulfill that, uh, that condition. So something that is raised up. The chair, you put the chair in front of you, you stand uh, on the legs of the chair, uh, with, with the legs of the chair in front of you, and then you use that as the sutra. Somebody is sitting. You use that as a, use that person as a sutra. All of this is valid. The point is that you are supposed to uh, take a sutra and pray so that nothing crosses you. Someone can say, well, there's nobody in my house. I'm praying by myself. The Prophet ﷺ, even when he prayed in the desert, he took his spear, stabbed it to the ground, and took that spear as his sutra. There is no one in sight for miles and miles. So this is one of the sunnah, acts of the salah that you take a sutra and you pray towards the sutra secondly if someone crosses crossing in front of the person praying is makruh however if a donkey a dog or a woman crosses in front of somebody who's praying then the salah is rendered void you can ask the same question as Aisha radiallahu asked when she heard this statement from the Prophet Islam. Ya Rasulullah, you're comparing us to dogs and donkeys? <laughs> That's not the meaning of the hadith, right? Don't go around calling women, oh, women, uh, all women are donkeys or they're dogs. Of course, there's a different word for that, but uh, as Muslims, we refrain from that, right? <laughs> but this is not the meaning of the hadith. This is not what the Prophet meant, that women are donkeys and dogs. 
it just so happens that this is what uh, would break the salah, right? It's not comparing that they are similar, but it's just what it is. Um, of course, there's another, a more deeper meaning to it as well. Uh, and it is what it is. We don't feel shy of our religion. A donkey brays, there's other authentic hadith, a donkey brays when it sees a shaitan. The black dog is a shaitan. And women are more susceptible to the tricks of shaitan than men. More susceptible to the tricks of shaitan of the dunya. And this is nothing that any woman should feel, ah, the brother's being a male chauvinist, He's what is wrong with him? No, no, it's not. You think about it. Just look at the world. Every commercial, every buying and selling, the goods, who goes shopping more? Who's running after everything that's coming out? Who? Can any woman deny that it's mostly women who do this more than the men? Even to this day where we have men acting like women and women acting like men, still these the glitters of the dunya, women are a little bit more susceptible to fall prey to these shaitani tricks. So if you want to really think deeply, it is what it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and he knows our strengths and weakness. So this is why the man is supposed to be the man of the house, safeguard his family and always keep them on track. A woman can make the mistake emotionally, whatever. Men, of course, can make mistakes too. But the point is in terms of leadership and deputy roles. This is one of the reasons. But anyways, let's get back on track. But I just want you to understand that you cannot use that hadith and abuse this hadith because it was not understood. Even after the Prophet ﷺ died, none of the companions used this hadith and blame, oh, women are dogs and donkeys, right? Nobody did this. So we cannot, we don't have the right to misuse the hadith. If somebody is trying to cross in front of you, you're supposed to extend your arm and prevent that person from uh, crossing in front of you. If he still insists, the Prophet ﷺ said forcefully, while praying, you forcefully push him, indicate to him that stop trying to cross in front of me. And the Prophet ﷺ said, stop that person, prevent him because he has a shaitan with him. In that hadith, he did not mention women. It is general. Even if you stick out your, a man is trying to cross in front of you, you stick out your hand. And the man's like, why are you sticking your hand out? He, he wants to slap your hand down and he still wants to cross in front of you. You fight him, meaning you push him hard. Don't let him cross in front of your salah because he has a shaitan with him. So as you can see, brothers and sisters, you cannot misuse the first hadith that I mentioned about the donkey, dog, and women. In this second hadith, this is general. doesn't matter if it's men or women. You fight the person, stop him because he has a shaitan with him. So this is something that you're supposed to prevent. Now, if someone goes in front of you, does it completely, uh, let's say a boy crosses in front of you, a man, this is something that is makruh, it is disliked. It diminishes from your salah. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, you fight the person forcefully. Don't let him uh, pass. All right. If a woman works for their family going outside for a job, are they behaving like men? No, this is if there is, there are certain things. Speaking of, thank you for asking this question. I think I missed a couple of questions earlier uh, from sisters. Yeah. All right. I found that. All right. So after, there's nothing wrong with women working provided they fulfill their hijab when they go out and provided they have the halal jobs and provided they are in a safe environment. So if those conditions are met, uh, of course, a woman can work. Um, and s s that's one point. Secondly, if there is no need for the woman to work, that there is no need for the woman to work. One of the signs of Yawm al and this is a hadith in the Musnad of Ahmed, the Prophet ﷺ said that tijara, business transactions, buying and selling, earning money, passing out money, will become so widespread 
that a woman will join her husband in working in the dunya. Right? This is one of the signs of the day of judgment. And definitely we are living in those times. Like a brother may be a doctor. And Allahumma barik. Especially in a country like this. A doctor makes enough money for which his wife does not have to work. But still we'll see that sister working while the children are with a babysitter. This is Islamically absolutely wrong. There is no need for the mother to be working. You cannot ignore your children. Both parents are working 10-12 hours a day. Who's taking care of the t uh, children? The TV, the internet. These are their parents. So Allah's laws has wisdom. The man is working hard outside. Who's, take, who's the ruler of the house when the man is gone? The mother, the wife. She's the leader of the house when the man is not there. Now, if the children are growing up without the Amir of the house, which is the father, then the deputy of the house, which is the mother, how are these children going to turn out? And we see in this Western society how the kids turn out. They don't even have any guardianship. No parents. They're both working day and night, right? So this is not something that as Muslims we should be. If Allah forbid something has happened, a woman needs to help her husband out, something is going on. She can find a halal job, she can fulfill the conditions of hijab, she needs to do something, okay. Maybe the woman has a field which is very important for women. Maybe she is a teacher for women. Maybe she is uh, a gynecologist. Maybe she is something, right, that benefits other women. There is a need for this. That's also another separate category of stuff. But at the same time, just like men, as fathers, they cannot ignore their wife and children. Of course, a woman, her number one duty in this dunya is to be a mother. You have to understand this, that many of us men, we forgot our fatherly duties. We forgot our husband duties and we're just chasing the money. And many of the sisters, they forgot their duty as a wife and a mother. And they're also chasing the money. Or they are married, but they still think the leader is her own mom. No, your leader is now your husband. So even after 10 years of marriage, she's still fulfilling whatever her parents are doing day and night and is ignoring her own husband and children. That's the other extreme that should not happen. So find a balance. If the balance can be fulfilled, it is okay. All right, let's take this question from the sisters. I have uh, two questions for you. First, since all stores are closed, are we able to send money for zakat after Ramadan? If for any reason zakat needs to be given a little early, you're allowed to do this. If it can be, if it has, if it gets delayed a little bit, that's also fine because of a crisis situation. But uh, don't delay too much, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, secondly, due to my mother's old age, she donates money to Bangladesh and replace for her fast. Because we cannot send money over now, my two sisters in Bangladesh will donate money on my mother's behalf. Will we be able to pay them back the money after Ramadan as well? All right, so th this is a very good question and it will help many people. First of all, when we make up like suppose someone is of old age grew old physically permanently now incapable of fasting ever again or someone has a severe illness that is also permanent and physically weakens the person from fasting so the sick and the elderly you have to give food Ta'am. Allah mentioned in the ayah, you give ta'am to the miskin. These are things that we have to understand. The sharia assigned. What is siyam? You abstain from food and drink. Do you abstain from money? It's not that while you're fasting in Ramadan, you're not allowed to work and earn money. You're not abstaining from money. You're abstaining from food and drink. Therefore, Allah says, you give food to the miskin in replacement of the food that you could not abstain from. 
So one meal a day for the miskin. This is extremely important. You do not give money to somebody that, hey, here's $10, go do something with it. I'm not fasting. You give the person food. Food replaces food. Money replaces money. We cannot mix and match. Now, maybe perhaps you are putting, you're giving the money to somebody to buy the food and give it to a miskin. As long as the miskin gets the food, you have fulfilled the sharia. But you do not give a miskin, here's money, go do whatever you want with it. You give food. This is the same thing. Zakatul mal, the pillar of Islam is money. Money for money. What happens during Zakatul fitr? On the day of Eid, you see people passing around boxes. I'll give your Zakatul fitr. Fitr, Zakatul fitr, fitr. Fitr comes from fatur, food. You have to give food uh, to the poor people before Salatul Eid. Zakatul mal. This is the zakat of wealth. So therefore you give wealth. It's not food that you're giving. You give wealth as your zakat from the wealth. So you have to understand this very carefully. So inshallah ta'ala, if this is properly done, then that's great. You can give money to somebody capable and trustworthy to give the food, to buy the food and give it to the miskin. No problem. Now secondly, from the sunnah, the Prophet ﷺ taught us, it is best for every Muslim community to give their zakat, to give their sadaqah, to give their zakatul fitr, to give their replacements for missed fasting, all within their own locality. So that every Muslim community takes care of every Muslim community. Great wisdom in this. So I would discourage you guys, inshallah, from doing this because there are plenty of poor Muslims in South Jersey. Don't send the money in Bangladesh. You will get an added reward, inshallah ta'ala, that you're taking care of your own community. There are poor people here. There's poor people everywhere. And it's sometimes I get amazed. And I've seen many Muslims, they think this way. No, we live in America, there are no poor people. This is completely false. Do you know, brothers and sisters? Um, and of course, I'm sure kids who grew up here, you'll know this. Our parents don't know unless they've been around, they've been involved, then they know. What is one of the main concerns, even in the media now? Schools are closed. Is it education? Think very deeply. What are you hearing? There are millions of children in America who go to school and depend on that cafeteria free meal. Even in my country in Bangladesh, people don't go to school for the sake of food. But that is the reality of America. Millions of children do not have food in their house. They go to school to get a free meal. This is this country. And then they spend billions of dollars every year killing Muslims and other people all over the world instead of feeding their own citizens, right? But that's a completely different topic and not in our control. But that's the reality. So don't think there are no poor Muslims in our locality. There are poor Muslims living in America. Give them the zakat, give them the sadaqah, give them the food, the rights of the miskin, inshallah ta'ala. And I, if you need me, as the imam of the community, I'm aware of many of these brothers and sisters, so if you need my help, inshallah, just, uh, I'm, I think you guys have my phone number, so just text me later and or call me, and then we can <clears throat> I can direct you to some of the brothers and sisters in the community who would qualify for that. All right, uh, let's see what other question we got. Uh, if someone asks you a question here, during the session, is it okay for any of us to jump in and answer? Uh, no, don't do that unless I know there are uh, other students of knowledge who tuned in. That's different. I have no problem uh, with another imam or another sheikh or a talib al ilm. Uh, if, if I missed something they want to answer, that's different. I have no problem with that. And I know the brothers who share the video or tune in, so uh, it's to them, so no issue with them. But. The local awam, uh, the average Muhammad and Fatima and uh, whatever it is from the community. No, don't do that, please. 
All right, last question. Oh, I lost track of time. It's 10 o'clock. Okay, no more questions, but here is something. Uh, day after tomorrow will be is Sunday night. That will be the last uh, lecture we'll give. I, I have to take a break for a couple of days because I have some personal things to do before Ramadan starts, uh, which is normal for all of us. So after Sunday, I'll take a three, four day break. So you have until Sunday, please let me know, email me, text me, put it on my Facebook or comment when we come back on Sunday. My plan for Ramadan is every night, every night, I know since we had the break, we've been having a lecture every other day. But inshallah in Ramadan, I would like to every day meet inshallah and I, I'll i take a surah, we'll cover the whole tafsir of that surah for that month. But I'll, I'll choose a surah that I can actually finish in 29 sessions, uh, inshallah ta'ala. But the issue is, when do you want to do it? And it's not going to be two hours long, no way. Uh, I'm diabetic, I want to fast as much as I can. I am not going to have the energy after iftar to uh, uh, speak for two hours. And we, we have other ibadat to do, pray isha, uh, tahajjud in our houses. So we'll keep it 30 minutes max. So you give me a time that works best. Comment please for the local brothers and sisters. Do you want to start 9 to 9.30 or 9.30 to 10 p.m.? Something like that, right? So I'll leave that to you. Uh, but if no one can decide, we cannot practice democracy where it's allowed, then I'll just make the decision and then we go with it. So that will be the plan for Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala. Every night, um, I'll, I haven't decided on which surah yet. But whatever it is, so that we can finish in the entire uh, month. So until Sunday, inshallah ta'ala, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep every one of us safe, healthy. Uh, and of course, may Allah reward us for these type of uh, virtual gatherings and increase us in knowledge and give us the ability to implement what we learn. Subhanakallah wa hamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.